So it is good to be here. In fact, last time I was actually up on this stage and teaching on a Thursday night was in the beginning of this year. And I was not the team leader of student ministries at that time, which is my role. My name is Matthew Mayer. And it's crazy that Matt Stokes invited me here to do that. And I have not been able to leave since. Yeah. So where we are, we're continuing with our study in the Psalms. Last week, Pastor Sal took us through Psalm 67. So if you're wondering why these Psalms are being chosen for Thursday nights and you weren't here the previous week, we're just doing a continuation, a study in the Psalm. So we are on 68, and after going through 68 and saturating myself in Psalm 68 and talking to Pastor Sal and my mother, of course, this Psalm would fall on me on this Thursday night because it's a very challenging Psalm. So before we get into it, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Psalm 68. If you do not have a Bible in the seat in front of you, there is a Bible, and I will pray over the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for opportunities like this where we can gather in one mind, one name, one family. Lord God, we bless you right now, Father, as you administer your word. Spirit, give to the people exactly what they came to get. In Jesus' name we always pray, amen. All right, so we are in Psalm 68, and of course, we are always crunched with time, so I'm going to move very fast through these scriptures. Hopefully, I can do my part, and I hopefully can hear the Spirit speak certain things, because the psalm that we're about to go over was written by David, King David, and it was a dedicatory psalm, which always brings a challenge to teach it, because a dedicatory psalm involves the person writing it, the penner, the author, to go through their own scriptures, their own history, and kind of tie things together as they use a psalm to worship or share with the people, as we're doing today. So this psalm was actually written by David. It's also a song. So if you know anything about music, it takes a lot to consider songwriting, especially in the Hebrew culture. So it's a song and a psalm. And it was actually on the skirt of David retrieving the Ark of the Covenant back to For his people, which was the presence of God, it symbolized the presence of God in their nation and in his life in particular. So this psalm that he wrote, it deals with a lot of historical, it deals with a lot of prophetic, and it deals with some practical. So, verse 1, as my students walk in, perfect. Verse 1, let God arise. And if we just close with that phrase right there, and we understood the potency inside of it, we can all go home. You see, when's the last time you allowed God to rise in your life? When's the last time you've considered that his presence isn't just knowledge It isn't just quoting scripture. When's the last time you actually considered that his presence was actually a person? A person that wants to reach down from heaven into our lives and help us deal with the issues of our lives. You see, as we say, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those also who hate him flee before him, we get excited because it deals with our enemies, right? We always want God to rise up in our life and deal with our enemies. And especially when we are through going through adversities. It's as if we want God to rise up in those situations, in those situations alone. So I say, before we even get into the next several verses, there's going to be a key to overcoming in these first few verses. And the key to overcoming is God's presence. It sounds so cliche, it sounds so simple. But whatever you're facing today, whatever you came in with tonight, the key to overcoming that is God's presence, letting him rise up in that situation, in that circumstance. You see, as I read forward, I see that as smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As whack melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. And once again, I say we would love God to overcome against our enemies and our adversities. But when's the last time you were willing to allow God to help you overcome yourself? 
You see, self really is our main enemy. You see, when self is living, God's losing. His presence can't be upon me, within me, if self has a place to live. We spend a lot of time feeding self. Self is fed, self breathes. Self gets in the way. You see, I kind of want to turn these verses against ourselves. As opposed to thinking about my enemies and God overcoming them and my adversities and God taking me through them, I'm going to ask God's presence to rise right here, right now, so I can overcome me. And like wax melting, maybe it's a thought that needs to melt away. Maybe it's a bad habit. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's a relationship. And you're steady trying to overcome those things in your own power by yourself. And then we turn to God and say, how come I can't do this? You see, the more we try to fix things, the more entangled we get with those things. And all the while, God is waiting for his presence to be evoked, invited, for self to die, surrender, for victory to enter. Yes, let that wicked thought perish at the presence of God. Let that wicked habit perish at the presence of God. Let that wicked lifestyle perish. And then the, light, the righteous will be glad. Let them rejoice before God, those who have dealt with self, so that God's presence can truly live within. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Verse 4 says, Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. We just did that in worship. Extol him who rides on the clouds. And I love this part. You actually have to know the background behind why David chose to use the rider of the clouds. In fact, he was taking a common phrase that was applied to the Philistine god, Baal. He was a pagan god. Baal was actually the god of the storms. So they believed that he was in control of the rain and the storms that came through and the things they did to kind of evoke his presence. So David is saying, the rider of the clouds, the God of the storms, is the God of the scriptures. And I'm going to take that term back and apply it rightly to the one who controls the storms, the one who blows the wind, the one who moves the clouds. His name, Yah. It's a short way to say Yahweh. And rejoice before him. You see, we often think of God as a lofty being, and he is. But it's not too lofty that he is not willing for us to reach him. He's not too far off where we can't get to him. You see, David understood that. So as he painted this picture that God is the one that rides on the clouds, he's the God of the storms, and we say he's up there, the highest heaven. He goes in to verse 5 and says he also is a father of the fatherless, a defender of the widows. That's God in his holy habitation. And I have to stop there and just say, wow. You see, God is the God of the highest heavens, but he's also the God of the lowest earth. You see, it's one thing to have this knowledge of God and how big and gigantic he is, the creator of the universe, and an entirely different knowledge that can become wisdom when you understand that same God wants to indwell you. He wants to be your God, your creator, and he comes as low as our friendship. You see, I don't know, you might not be fatherless. You might not be that widow. But God still cares where you are. You see, he wants to meet you where you are. And as we often think about the knowledge, and I may have knowledge of this here scripture, and you may as well, and I may have it with such depth, but I tell you this, this here scripture and the God that we serve, he comes to full light when I experience the depths. 
You see, I was that particular Christian that knew it all up here. I could tell you about the God of the heavens from the highest heaven, but I failed to consider that he wanted to come meet me where I was in the lowest earth. And it was only going, going through the depths that this knowledge became real. You see, trying to figure out the perfect example other than my own life to explain this concept, I came across a woman of faith that you guys should be familiar with. Her name's Johnny Erickson Tata. She became a quadriplegic at the age of 17 after she dove and hit her neck, leaving her in that paralyzed state. I found so many unbelievable quotes from her life. One was, God has chosen not to heal me, but to hold me. He has chosen not to heal me, but to hold me. And I guarantee you, any type of knowledge that she may have had of this lofty God became so real the moment she found herself in that wheelchair. And as she studied the scriptures and found all types of verses about healing, her intimacy was deepened when she realized it wasn't God's plan to heal her, and she got to know him even deeper as he held her. You see, from the highest heaven to the lowest earths, God sets the solitary in families. And I was stuck on that, that word solitary. And I couldn't figure out why God would set solitary, isolation, the fact that you are in need in a family. Then I realized if we would link up with our families and realize that daddy can provide, mommy does her part, my siblings come through, then why would I need God? You see, God sets the solitary in the family, but he also provides the fulfillment to fill the solitary with the family. So dad, please hear this. Your role, your office to your wife or your children, you need to rely fully and solely on God. Mom, them children in the world that we live in today, you see, you may feel like the father or the husband can take care of all the needs, but your affection needs to be fully set upon God. Children, my students, you can look to mom and dad to provide, and they will, but you have to look higher. You see, your heavenly father wants to provide everything in your life. And if he sees us only relying on our human resources, how can he deliver or give us his heavenly resources? Verse 6. He sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. But let the rebellious dwell in a dry land. You see, he can bring out the bound, those are locked up or in bondage to certain things, whatever that thing may be in your life, you have to identify it. And he can bring you into spiritual prosperity. You see, I don't know what is binding you tonight. I don't know the bondage that you came in with. It could be a, a sin. It could be an addiction. It could be a depression. You see, it's only God that can unwind it. It's only God that can set you free from it. And when you allow his spirit, I say, lube up your soul, your emotional man or woman, then you will never be dry. You see, it says that the rebellious, the one that rejects God, dwells in a dry land. And you see some rebellious people that are not dwelling in any dry land. They're living in mansions, and they look like they're living just fine. But how about their soul? That's the dry land. You see, I need this spirit. I need the spirit that it may determine my emotional man or woman. And that, therefore, affects my physical man or woman. Verse 7, O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, David is actually going into the history of Israel. He's recalling the time when God went before his people, the Israelites, when they were in bondage to Egypt and when he delivered them from there and went before them in the wilderness. If you're looking at your Bible, you'll notice a word next to the wilderness. 
And it says, Selah. And if you're wondering who Selah is in the scriptures, she's actually a musical note. You see, most of the Psalms are written to melody or music. And if you've never been, heard, been taught this before, we often need a Selah in our life. We often need a musical rest. And I say there's no music during a musical rest, but the rest is just as important as the making of the music. Let this be your rest as God looks to speak to you tonight. The earth shook, verse 8. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Speaks of God's provision in that time of the nation of Israel. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. This was at the administration of the law with Moses. And the entire mount, this monstrosity shook. And this kills me because when's the last time I shook at the presence of God? You see, if a mountain could move and shake because of God's presence, how come my life doesn't move like that? How many times have I heard the gospel account? How many times have I heard all those stories as Matt teaches them here on Sunday? And it doesn't move me. How many times have I heard Jesus going to the cross and it's just another story? When's the last time my eyes moved, my tears Dare not let a mountain take that from me. You, O oh God, you sent plentiful rain, whereby you confirmed your inheritance when it was weary. Once again, speaks of God's provision to the nation of Israel. Your congregation dwelt in it. You, O oh God, provided from your goodness for the poor. Midway through, because I want to get to verse 16, I realized that God's strength behind you and I his concern for you and I, his love within you and I, and his arms beneath you and I are more than sufficient for the job ahead of you and I. You see, let me repeat that. God's strength behind you, his concern for you, his love within you, his arms beneath you are more than sufficient for the job ahead of you. You see, when David is going into the history books of his people, he's recalling the times when God was faithful you see, you may not be able to look back in your past and, and see anything that showed God was there. You may feel as if God abandoned you. You may feel as if he's left you, which keeps you stuck in your present, and it's hard to look forward. And I say this, if that's where you're at. You see, if you keep looking back, if you keep going into your history, you're eventually going to hit a certain point. You're going to hit the cross. And the cross is God's greatest statement of faithfulness to you or I. So if you feel as if God has not been there in your past, I direct you to the cross on Calvary's hill. You see, God was not only with us, but he was willing to die for us. You see, his strength behind me was all the times that things were supposed to go a certain way but something stepped in, intervened, and stopped it. I don't know what that looks like in your life. It was those times where God redirected you, where he kept you from further calamity. You just don't see it. And in case you forget, he's quick to remind us of Jesus. And that very life alone is enough to convince me that he is faithful. You see, if he's taking you this far where you're sitting in a sanctuary listening to the word, why would he abandon you now? Why would he stop coming through? The Lord gave the word in verse 11. That's a commandment. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. As David transitions from the exodus, which was the time in the wilderness for the Israelites, leaving Egypt, he goes into this section of scriptures, which is verse 11 to verse 14, and he's recalling the promised land experience for the people of Israel. You see, Moses was no longer. He had passed away. He did not get to go into the promised land. He only saw it. Joshua took over. 
Just a side note. You see, the law can never bring you into the promised land. The law can never bring you into the spirit-filled life. Only Joshua, which is the Hebrew word for Jesus, can do that for you. Now David's recalling that when they got into that land, they had to fight. They had to go to war. God had already promised you that territory. But you have to partner with him in that process. You see, the victory is yours. But that doesn't mean you don't have to fight for it. As God gave the word, victory only comes when God gives the word. And great was the company of those who just repeated it, proclaimed it. You see, when you petition to heaven, what you're doing is you're giving heaven heaven's word. Heaven has a word. It's an economy. That's why you pray on earth as it is already fulfilled, done, spoken in heaven. And when you supply heaven with heaven's word, God answers. Yeah. You see certain echoes take a little bit more time. You may have released God's word to heaven and the echo has yet to come back, but God's word will never return void. So you be patient because it is coming. Kings of armies flee, they flee. And she who remains at home divide the spoil. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver from low to high and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Zalman. Again, it speaks of the victories in the land of Canaan, the promised land, as Joshua, he led the people in, and they took the land that God had promised. Verse 15 and 16. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? And I kind of got confused on this passage. And I'm sitting there saying, a mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. But when you do your research, you find that the mountain of Bashan is a series of large mountains in that area outside of Jerusalem. So it can't be the mountain of God. In fact, it's supposed to say the mountain of God is in contrast with the mountain of Bashan. You see, the mountain of Bashan had such a strategic location. It was more impressive. If you were going to build a city, you would certainly want to be by such mountains. So for God to choose this little land called Jerusalem, which was low, it was a very small hill-like area, you have to say, why would he do that? You see, mountain of Bashan fumes with envy. You know, it's that person that is high and mighty, it's that person that has their own resources. And yet they see you and I come through little old Jerusalem. And God wants to elevate or uplift little old Jerusalem because he takes the base things of the world and he confounds those that think they're up here. And he takes the fools of the world to put to shame those who think they're wise. So he said, Jerusalem, as David writes, I'm going to make you my chosen city and as you translate that spiritually, you are Jerusalem. You are the city of God. So David takes us through the Exodus. He takes us through the promised land. Now he takes us through his present situation, which was making his way to Jerusalem. Verse 17, verse 18. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. It simply speaks of angels. The angels of God are innumerable. You cannot count them. Thousands of thousands just means he has enough the Lord is among them as in Sinai in his holy place. Verse 18, very challenging verse. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. Again, there's several translations to this verse. We're going to go into one in a moment. And the only way we can go into that in a moment is because it comes to us in the New Testament. Right now in the Old Testament, as David's writing it, he's again recalling the time when the nation of Israel was released from bondage from Egypt. And as God led captivity into his own captivity, he took them captive and he allowed them to leave with gifts. He not only set them free, he delivered them. He gave them gifts 
which were from the Egyptians. Think about that. He took from them the people that probably was responsible for their prosperity, and then he made them give the gifts, which is called restitution, to the people. You see, Joel the prophet says that God will never allow these locusts in our life to eat away at the years. In fact, it says, I'll restore to you the years that were eaten by the locust. Only you can identify what the locust is in your life. You see, the enemy had me where he wanted me. He thought he had me isolated. He thought he had me locked up. But God said, I'm going to use that situation to teach this here boy something about my economy. And I will restore to him all the years that everybody else thinks he lost. You see, when God led this captive into his captivity, he set me free. You see, as a prisoner of the state, SBI 314525E, there were times where I believed that identity. And when I believed that identity, I was getting a little bit more bitter in that certain situation. And there's a reason why I chose to wear khaki today. It's because where I once was, actually, I'm only 11 months out of that situation, if you've never heard my story before. As a prisoner of the state, And I was told by all of my peers that you will never see khaki the same way. In fact, you will never wear it again. And I used to think about that. You see, I used to wear the khaki, but I never allowed the khaki to wear me. And though they looked like grave clothes, I knew that something had to die when wearing grave clothes. And it was myself. So the more self died and the more Jesus could arise, the more freer I became. There were so many situations that I could actually share endlessly. One in particular was a sergeant, and this sergeant would come through every single day in my housing unit. It was me and 37 other men beside myself. About 20 of us would gather every day at the same time to lead Bible study, and I would teach it just like I'm teaching now. And this sergeant would come through, and he would mock our faith, and he would say, hey, mayor, praise the Lord. And I'd say, praise the Lord, sir. And he said, it doesn't look like your faith's doing too much for you today. Your faith can't get you out of here. And I used to sit there and say, you have no idea where my faith is going to take me. In fact, my prayers saw me on a stage like this as still a prisoner of the state. I used to deal with that sergeant every time I saw him. He got a little bit more atrocious toward me, a little bit more animosity And actually, he would come about an inch away from my face, and he would just be in my face, chewing me out. It was as if he was trying to make me respond. And if I responded, he would be able to lock me up. I don't know what it was about me, but he always would find a way to mess with me. And a few times, he was so close to my face, and I had my hands behind my back, and I just said, yes, sir, whatever he was saying. He was calling me a clown. And all the while, I'm angry on the inside. And I'm cursing him on the inside. You see, I would go back to my housing unit and my friends would be like, how did you handle that? You had such composure. And I'm like, you don't get it. I didn't handle that. I failed. No, you didn't. You didn't respond. I said, yeah, but my heart did. You see, that would happen every day until I was able to stand with him in my face as I prayed for him in my heart. And the moment that I was able to pray for this man, I felt sorry for his salvation was the day that he stopped treating me that way. And I realized it was because I thought as a prisoner of the Lord, not a prisoner of the state. You see, that's why Paul was able to write all these letters and say the prisoner of the Lord because he was so free while he was doing it. And I believe that if you believe you're a prisoner of the state or a prisoner of addiction or a prisoner of your behavior or a prisoner of your past, you're going to act that way. But the moment you take that a step further and say, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, you will be free right where you are. And as these gates would slam shut every day, I would watch them. And I had no desire to leave them. And I used to say to myself, if I have no desire to leave, am I technically locked up? And I've never been freer, even to this day. 
Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation, verse 19. I don't know what you're working for, but if it's only those benefits at the end of the job on earth, then you're missing the Lord's benefits who wants to load them upon you daily. Verse 20, our God is the God of salvation and to God the Lord belong, escapes from death. I said, what does that even mean in my new King James Version? It actually says, and to the God, the Lord, belong the issues from death. But God will wound the head of his enemies, the hairy scalp of the one who still goes on in his trespasses. The Lord said, I will bring back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea. Two really different areas, the sea and the mountain peaks of Bashan. Basically, God is willing to go anywhere to bring you back. That's the point that your foot may crush them in blood and the tongues of your dogs may have their portion from your enemies. Verse 24, they have seen your procession, O God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. And I stop and I just simply say, when was the last time somebody saw God have a parade in your life? When was the last time he led you? And as people saw your life, they said that can only be explained by God. You see, not all parades are a celebration. You see, some parades are for mourning. You may be suffering, but it's in how you suffer that people will say, only God can get that person through. In fact, people saw me locked up, but they saw me smiling so much. They said, how are you smiling so much? You see, they were locked into the same circumstances as me, the same guard, the same sergeant, the same meal, the same everything, yet I was able to do so by suffering successfully. And it wasn't the word of God coming off my tongue. It was simply my conduct and the peace of God coming off my life. I'm going to burn through this text real quick. We have a little bit more. The singers went before you. The players on instruments followed after. Among them were the maidens playing timbrels. It speaks of a parade. Bless God in the congregations, the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin, their leader, the princes of Judah and their company, the princes of Zebulon and the princes of Naphtali. I don't have enough time to get into those historical and a little bit prophetical. Your God has commanded your strength. Strengthen, O God, what you have done for us. Strengthen what you began in my life, Lord. The Bible declares that he will finish what he started. When's the last time you asked him to do that? You see, we're all works in progress, but sometimes God wants another invitation into your life to begin to renovate that thing that got a little bit creaky, like a floor. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring presents to you. Pretty interesting, because when David wrote this, Solomon wasn't king yet, because Solomon is his son. And it was actually King Solomon where kings from all over the world would come visit him because of the temple and they heard of his wealth and his wisdom. So David is speaking prophetically about kings coming to the temple. But it's also speaking of a new king, a greater king, one who would come who was greater than Solomon, wiser than Solomon, and it was Jesus. And it was those kings, as we call the three wise men, there may have been way more than that. They came from a far country to bring presents to Jesus. Rebuke the beasts of the reeds, the herd of bulls with the calves of the peoples, till everyone submits himself with pieces of silver. Scatter the peoples who delight in war. Sadly, that simply means God will either destroy or empower. He'll either devour those who reject or he'll empower those who accept. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. Acts 2, as Luke pens it, he records people from the nations of Egypt and those surrounding areas would come at the day of Pentecost. That's prophetic. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. What is he talking about? Acts verse 8, where an Ethiopian eunuch, he meets Philip and Philip baptizes him. He is coming to know the God of Israel as he extends his grace and mercy to you and I, the Gentile. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides on the heaven of heavens, which were of old. David continues that theme that we introduced in verse four, that same title of Baal, 
the God of storm, David kind of is closing out his thoughts with that same idea. Indeed, he sends out his voice, a mighty voice. Ascribe strength to God, 34. His excellence is over Israel. His excellence is over those who are governed by him. That's what the word Israel means. Israel means governed by God. So you have your physical Israel, your nation of Israel. Then you have your spiritual Israel, which is the individual who accepts God and he becomes governed by his spirit. Excellence will be over you. And his strength is in the clouds. O oh God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. We know that. Blessed be God. And I finish with this one concept. It deals with God being more awesome than his holy place. You see, you may not hear this taught or said in too many other places. But I would do you no justice if I kept it to myself. In fact, as I had this point down and I always run it by my, one of my mentors, who's my mother, she basically says, how are you going to explain that? It's very profound, Matthew, but people may misunderstand it. Please don't misunderstand me. You see, as God is more awesome than his holy places, more awesome than the earth he created, more awesome than the heaven that he lives in, I say this. Jesus isn't a means to get to heaven. Heaven is a means to get to Jesus. And some may say, I thought Jesus was the only way to get to heaven. Yes. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can get to my Father except through me. But too many of us, we simply use Jesus and think we're going to get to heaven. We use ministry and works. We use our knowledge, our associations, and think that's enough to get to heaven. No, but heaven, heaven in its purest, holiest state is simply a way for us to get to Jesus. You see, God doesn't want us just to think about going to heaven. He wants us to think about going to him. He's the entire purpose that we would want to even go to heaven. It's because Jesus is there. And the reason why I want to go to him there is because he came down here to get me. See, God is not impressed with us doing things for him. He doesn't need that. He smiles when we do things with him. He smiles when we bring him along into our job, whatever that job is, as a lawyer, as a judge, as a trash man, as a police officer. When you bring him in with you, you are an agent of God in that career. Let us not use Christianity or the name of Jesus and think it will get us to heaven. God created the purest place that can house himself, therefore allowing us to get to him. And I close, and I say this with all respect. Who do we think we are that we can simply accept Jesus? Shouldn't I be super thankful that he accepted me? That I could say a simple prayer, I accept Jesus into my heart, and then go on living as usual? Shouldn't I be grateful that the creator of the universe subjected himself in flesh, that I may experience his life? And that I am thankful that he chose me and he accepts me as I am. You see, blessed be God is the essence of this psalm. As we began, let God arise. And as we finish, blessed be God. 
we know that everything in between those two phrases, those two verses, is governed by God. It's in control, under his control. You see, God does work all things together for the good to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. If he didn't, then I would not be standing here teaching you anything. In fact, he took what I did, which caused harm, which was evil, and he recycled it, and he's brought good out of it. So I don't care what you've done or what people said you've done. If you just turn it over to God, he will recycle everything about your life. He will restore you, and he will give you a brand new beginning. If you believe that, you say amen. Amen. And as we call Pastor Sal up and the worship team, we're going to go into a time of communion. And what an appropriate time to consider what Jesus did for you. And maybe you've said that prayer that you've asked him to come into your heart. You've accepted him. But I challenge you right here and right now, during communion, that you thank him for accepting you.